Uh, hello, everybody. Ho hopefully you can see and, and hear me. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Tina, for the introduction. It, it's a real privilege um, to be here and to, to have the chance to, to, to do this and to, um, to hopefully give some useful insights about uh, the state of play of, of EU politics and, and EU policy making right now. Um, as Tina mentioned, uh, I, I work uh, as a consultant at Fleischmann Hillard in, in Brussels, uh, but until recently um, and for most of my career, I was a journalist in, in Brussels um, working for the FT uh, and Bloomberg, uh, among others. So um, my, uh, my job was to run around and get other people to talk about what on earth was going on with with EU politics and and policy making and uh, it, it's very gratifying and um, frankly cathartic to have the chance to to now do that myself and and share my thoughts with you and I I, I very much hope they're useful. Um, what I'm hoping to do uh, with this uh, with this chance to um, to, um, to to lay out my thoughts on this is is to really try and set the scene of where the EU finds itself. Uh, going into this political semester, um, it's um, it's a pretty unique moment, uh, and that's not just because of the the, the backdrop of of the pandemic. Um, it's to do with it's to do with a wider constellation of of reasons, and and, and that's what I that's what I want to go into. Um, I think it's fair to say that Europe has had its fair share of um, of political crises o over the past few years. Um, we've sort of had a a, a crisis decade, uh, in in a way, um, if you'd like. Uh, but um, I think one of the thing that one of the things that defined that that period of crisis um, is that, in a way, they were crises that were about how to save the furniture that was inherited from the twentieth century. Um, the euro, in the case of the of the eurozone crisis, uh, the Schengen area, um, in the case of the the political crisis over migration, um, and also the single market to an extent um, in uh, in the negotiations that followed the Brexit referendum in 2016. Um, the challenge I think the EU was facing now is how to meet the demands of the 21st century, and. Those demands are, are, are well known, those, those challenges. Um, Brussels is fond of talking about the twin transition, so the, the green transition and the digital transition. Um, it's not just that, though. It's also um, a challenge to do with values, the fact that the EU is no longer simply an economic community. It's a community of values. And to what extent can those values be, be asserted and, and defended? Um, and it's also a challenge bound up by uh, the growing political drumbeat now for greater strategic autonomy, uh, which is something born out of um, events during the Trump administration in the US uh, to do with um, strategic rivalry with, with China uh, and also to, to do with uh, lessons drawn um, from, from the pandemic. Um, so that, that's the, basically a very broad way of, of describing the, the challenge that EU policymaking uh, now, um, now faces. Um, and it's and it's a very big agenda, but the the EU finds itself facing it in um, in a very unusual position. I think it's something that could uh, generously be, be described as a very delicate um, political position, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and it's it's worth mentioning just um, at the top here that. This is a delicate political position which has direct ramifications for the financial services sector um, and for how other sectors get regulated as well. Um, the way regulation happens in Brussels, if it ever was, is certainly no longer any kind of technocratic exercise. It's one directly influenced by these political drivers that I've just been talking about. And um, to put it bluntly, there is there is no rampart behind which the financial services sector can hide to to shield itself from the the political winds that are blowing in Brussels and and throughout EU policy making right now. I think perhaps a useful way to to describe the situation we find ourselves in is to imagine um, the 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 sort of strategic outlook of. Ursula von der Leyen, the, the president of the European Commission, and to imagine her in her office on the 13th floor of the Berlaymont, the, the European Commission's headquarters in Brussels, as, as she sort of takes in the, the challenge that is facing her uh, over, the, over the coming months and, uh, and indeed for the remainder of her mandate. Um, 
to compare this to former times, I think traditionally the European Commission president would want to sit in their office and they would want to know that in whatever agenda they're pursuing, they had strong support from, from the biggest, most powerful member states in the European Union, or at least that there was a way that Brussels had found to try and, and balance their competing interests um, in, those, in those areas where, where the EU intended to drive. And um, at the moment, uh, to put it kindly, that's, that's not quite where we are. Uh, one of the big traditional EU member states has left the union entirely. Um, which is something I will, I will come back to talk about a bit more. And it's now increasingly obvious that it is, a, it is a strategic competitor sitting at the EU's doorstep, which is not a problem that the EU is, is familiar with. Uh, another large member state, Germany, is the home of Ursula von der Leyen's principal political patron throughout her entire career, Angela Merkel. Well, Angela Merkel is is leaving the scene. She's not, not off the stage yet, but is, 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 certainly, is certainly due to leave it in the near future and um the country is is politically in a in a state of flux and um it looks like it might stay that way for a while as as coalition, as coalition negotiations go on uh, italy is under from brussels's point of view its strongest most stable most pro eu leadership in a long time uh, with mario draghi but that is um leadership and a government with a time limit simply because of the nature of of the agreement of the coalition that supports mario draghi and then that brings us to france which is now going into its own election cycle with Emmanuel Macron uh, facing the challenge of re-election next year. Um, and it, it's worth, just as an aside, I think, just noting that even though uh, Macron is, is approaching a re-election campaign, he is in something very oddly for the EU, uh, akin to a kind of EU version of a unipolar moment, um, given, given the, the situation I've, I've just described. Um, he is the principal sponsor left for Ursula von der Leyen's nomination as president of the European Commission. He is a close political ally of Charles Michel, the, the president of the European Council. And he finds himself, by virtue of the calendar, about to take over the EU's rotating presidency, the rotating national presidency, um, at the start of, of next year. Um, all of which are um, very powerful ways to have an influence uh, over the agenda in Brussels. Um, especially when uh, other countries might be a bit more preoccupied with their internal politics and coalition forming, um, not just countries I've already talked about, but also the Netherlands, for example, as well. Um, so that's definitely something I think worth bearing in mind um, to try and understand events as they unfold uh, over, the, over the coming months. Uh, back to, to von der Leyen in her office. Another thing a European Commission president would usually want is to know that alliances are secure and that um, and that basically there is as much as possible a shared multilateral agenda in the international community. The EU is a, is a multilateral actor um, from its very DNA. Um, and I think um, another way of sort of understanding a bit about what's going on in EU policymaking right now is, is just to understand that the EU is constitutionally by its very nature, ill-adapted to, to an environment of great power rivalry on the international scene. Uh, but as we've seen recently, it's no surprise to anybody, uh, relations with the US right now are pretty complicated. And um, that's not just because of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, it's not just because of submarines. Um, I think what we're discovering is the limitations of political space on both sides of the Atlantic uh, when it comes to the ability to take big initiatives together. And that manifests itself in various ways. Um, just to give a couple of, of examples, um, the possible difficulties getting an international tax deal through Congress, uh, the difficulties of having a transatlantic deal on data, crucial for the development of the digital economy, um, the um, French pushback against having a more ambitious agenda for the inaugural meeting of the Trade and Technology Council, perhaps something born not just out of anger over submarine contracts, but um, also out of strategic autonomy considerations in, in areas such as semiconductors. So, um, you know, short way of summing up the EU-US relation, relationship right now is it, it's complicated. Um, that then brings us to another crucial strategic partner for the European Union. And that's the UK, because the UK is undoubtedly going ahead a crucial partner, and that, that partnership will matter. But it's, it's a partnership that's not really materialising uh, at, at the moment. And there's uh, a couple of things I can say about this. Uh, the first is um, that, um, and sometimes I feel this isn't said enough, actually, things that are said in London get noticed in Brussels. And, and all of us who are here working in, in this world, be it in journalism or in consulting, 
uh, can see that just from every conversation we have with a policymaker here. Um, just to give an example, the UK government last month set out its plans to review or, or drag a comb through all the remaining UK, um, all the remaining sorry EU legislation that's still on the uh, on the UK statute book. Um, when it did that, uh, it explained it in terms of obviously the fact that the, you know the UK is no longer in the EU or the single market, um, but it, it chose to use certain language in the way it. Um, it explained what it was going to do. So just to give a couple of examples in, in documents the UK published at the time, uh, on financial services, for example, the UK said, the regulatory regime that we've inherited from the EU is inflexible and overly restrictive, to give just one example. Um, to give another, um, GDPR, which is obviously seen as, as one of the EU's crowning regulatory achievements, was, um, was, was described as something the UK needed to move away from uh, with an announcement that the UK would look for a more proportionate and less burdensome system than GDPR. Um, there was also a, a quote from David Frost, um, the Minister of State at the Cabinet Office, saying that uh, overbearing regulations were often conceived and agreed in Brussels with little consideration of the UK national interest. No, little consideration of the UK national interest. All those things don't go unnoticed here. And what is happening in Brussels is, is a hardening um, uh, conviction that the UK government is wedded to a path of regulatory divergence. And that um, in a way the government wants to um, wants to promote that mentality, that outlook, um, not just in government and the civil service, but also in, in business. Um, and that, that links the UK government's decision, for example, to reject a veterinary agreement for, for Northern Ireland uh, along the lines the EU has proposed um, with um, the ways it is now looking now to to revise um, EU rules and other sectors, including financial services. Um, and there's a sense that the UK has chosen that path and, and that the UK is determined to reject what um, what perhaps the UK government sees as, as the comforts of, of alignment. Um, and that feeds directly into thinking here. Uh, the other thing I, I can say is that uh, obviously, however cooperation develops um, and specific measures to promote ties in the area of financial services, that is completely linked to the broader climate of the EU-UK relationship. And that at the moment is tethered to the situation regarding the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, there's not much I can say here about what's an incredibly complex situation um, beyond what we all already know. Um, but I mean, if I just to give sort of one uh, insight on this, um, the fact that the European Commission was braced for Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, so this is the emergency get out clause, to be potentially triggered by the UK during the Conservative Party conference, I think gives an indication of, 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 how, um, of how Brussels sees this uh, situation um, right now. Um, I'd also add that the, these are not, the Northern Ireland is front and centre. It's not the only challenge affecting the wider relationship. There's also a trading relationship to be built uh, within the framework of the trade treaty that was agreed last year. And um, their thoughts are already being given, I think, on both sides of the channel to potential rocks in the road. Uh, having a trade agreement is by no means a guarantee that you won't have trade disputes. And in an era where, for example, um, both sides are thinking about how to onshore green manufacturing, the UK and, and, the, and the EU is thinking about tighter controls on foreign subsidized takeovers, you can see plenty of scope, for example, for possible disputes um, in the area of, of state aid. Um, so um, that is basically the backdrop to what is going to be or should be or the European Commission would like to be an era of great ambition with uh, a legislative program delayed by the pandemic that should now be rolled out uh, which includes among other things uh, the biggest reopening of financial rules uh, over the next year or so uh, since the aftermath of the 2008 crisis but it's a very difficult backdrop against which to do that not least because of the ongoing coalition talks in Germany um, what I've set out here isn't the complete scene. Um, I haven't talked, for example, about the, inter the EU's internal difficulties uh, over rule of law very much, but they're not to be underestimated. And their, their ability to, to poison other areas of, of policymaking um, is very real. Um, but I hope I have painted a picture of this delicate situation uh, at a time of great challenges for the EU uh, and also a time of, of necessarily high ambitions. Um, so I'll stop there because I want to leave lots of time for questions, but, um, but thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, I hope that's been useful. Thanks so much.
So um, I've had a couple of questions come in by the miracle of technology. Um, and one question is, uh, how important will the US's attitude towards the UK be in terms of the current free movement, um, free movement of goods and arguments around Northern Ireland? Um, so sorry, I might be slightly mis might, might, might be slightly misreading the question. Um, uh, I can say that this is something which the EU is monitoring incredibly carefully. And um, despite all the current difficulties in the relationship with the US, obviously the EU is at pains to get across its side of the story concerning Northern Ireland. And um, it, I think it's, it's not overestimating it to say that the EU is counting on the US here um, to, to play an important role. Um, the, the extent uh, you know, to which the US can, can exert leverage if it wants to in, in this area is, is great, um, but it does fluctuate a bit. And, um, and obviously it's been linked um, a lot to the prospects for an, uh, a UK-US trade deal, which have obviously now, now receded. Um, but at the same time, it, it's, it's a crucial partnership for the UK. So I think it's somewhere where the, the EU is, is placing lots of hopes. But um, I mean, just to flesh this out a bit, th there's a difficulty here, which is that the um, um, if you sort of look at the work of Maros Shevchevich, so the EU's Brexit commissioner, when he goes and debriefs EU member states, he says to them, look, um, I'm going to look for every solution within the, the remit of the protocol. We're not going to renegotiate the protocol like, like the UK wants, but I will look for every creative solution within the protocol. And, um, and then what happens is the vast majority of EU member states turn around and say, oh, fantastic, there's, there's wiggle room in the protocol. That's excellent. Please go away and explore it and, and park the problem again with, with the European Commission, because frankly, their political bandwidth is taken up a lot by other issues as well. Um, and so that leaves the European Commission in a very difficult position, um, because it's also the argument that then puts towards the US saying, look, we're going to explore creativity within the framework of the protocol, um, but we're not going to reopen the protocol. Um, what no one knows, and that's why this is difficult, is how far that can really take you. And that's something which is still being worked out. And so the, the huge question right now is, can it take you far enough to find some kind of lasting understanding where all parties are broadly satisfied? And I think that is a very big open question right now. Um, so thank you very much for that question and apologies for answering it with another question, but that's, that's the privilege of being a speaker at these events. Um, then I've got a second question, which is, do you see any movement on the access of financial services firms uh, to the single market from the UK? Um, uh, okay, so uh, I actually, just as it happens, I did check in about this with the European Commission um, the, this morning um, in, in various ways. Um, and um, th so th this, is a very, this is a very difficult one. Um, the Commission is currently considering, to my understanding, um, what to do. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the issue of um, the temporary equivalence decision on, on clearing, um, which is what's front and centre here right now, and hasn't decided what it's going to do. Um, uh, but it's, it's clear that for the Commission now, as it contemplates what to do about the fact that the deadline is looming, uh, it's clear that any um, any steps that are taken now need to fit into a need to fit into a strategy and need to be steps which which are, which have which have credibility um, in terms of laying out a plan to to develop um, the euro clearing market uh, inside um, inside the single market. Um, in terms of broader um, equ equivalence decisions, uh, to be honest, I I think that is very tied up to the wider relationship, and that, that that's just not going to be on the horizon while the situation with the Northern Ireland Protocol remains as it is now. 